Since me and I appointed Jim as one of the co-chairs of the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force. Since helping to form this initial guiding framework, he's led the steering committee for the city's strategic housing implementation plan. Currently, he serves on the committee on removing barriers to affordable housing. He is sensitive to the unique character that our historic neighborhoods offer to the authenticity and quality of life in our city, and is committed to finding creative, balanced solutions that provide opportunities for affordable housing in our central city. Thank you for helping make this year the biggest historic homeowner fair to date and for participating in the preservation of the historic places that make San Antonio unique. Be sure to visit SAPreservation.com for more information on upcoming events and resources offered by the Office of Historic Preservation. Thanks, Ron. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, he, he uh, speaks in public for a living, and I'm nowhere near as smooth as him, but uh, I'll, do, I'll try to do my best here. So, um, I'm here to talk to you today about um, pre preservation sort of writ large, right? Um, and, and, and think about preserving not just the historic structures in our neighborhoods, but looking at the socioeconomic character and managing uh, the, the, the change that our historic districts and older neighborhoods in San Antonio have been experiencing over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, so we, we normally think about preservation as being about old buildings, but it's about something else. Um, I'm gonna back up a little bit to the early 1970s when my parents first moved to San Antonio and bought this old house on Madison Street. Uh, in 1975, and this was an, an, an article by a guy named Ron White that told the story of it, like when you want an old house badly enough. So this was in King William, um, one of our oldest historic districts, and at the time, uh, if you're all familiar with the term redlining, it was a redlined neighborhood. My parents could not get a mortgage on this house. There was no lending institution in town uh, that would lend money on it. So. Uh, they got a $10,000 loan from a local named Walter Mathis who was interested in preserving the old structures and went after it. So there's me on the left in the red shorts standing in the pit where the fireplace used to be. This house used to face Alamo Street. Walter had turned it around to face uh, Madison. Next, door. Um, there's me with my friend Mike Casey in 1976. I guess I have my Robin Underroos are, and there's the family duster. Um, across the street is uh, Ed Slazak's uh, shed where there was a lathe where my dad hand turned all the spindles on the porch. I went to Bonham Elementary School in the early 70s. Uh, the neighborhood was much different. Uh, most of downtown was much different. You know, this was uh, 20 years after white flight had begun. Um, I think there were uh, three other white kids in, in the school. And, and so, you know, I, I grew up in Southside San Antonio, essentially. It doesn't feel like that anymore. Next, Corey. Um, so this is, this is um, the old pine boards that act as the interior sheathing of most homes that were built um, throughout the last probably 150 years, I'd say. In some cases, it's shiplap, but often it's just old pine planks, right? And then the siding is nailed directly to the exterior, often without a vapor barrier. You know, all my friends' houses look like this on the inside, and they didn't have air conditioning, and we didn't have air conditioning in the school, right? We'd open the windows and turn the ceiling fans on. But that didn't seem weird to me, because we were fixing up an old house, and we didn't have air conditioning either, and our walls looked like that. But they were on the way to becoming something else. Um, you know, but the big difference is, like, I had all these toys, and I had all these resources, and, and my friends didn't, right? It was a really poor neighborhood. Corey. So, um, this is the house my parents picked up in 1985, the old Josky house, 241 King William, and I spent my summers and um, and and vacations and so forth, um, you know, taking alligator old paint off the porch with a with a blow torch. We didn't know lead was back bad for you back then, right? So who knows what I might have accomplished if I hadn't <laughs> done that, right? Um, <laughs> so next next one, Corey. Uh, you know, at, at the time, there was a Texas uh, monthly article called The Snootiest Neighborhood in Texas, right? And it talked about this incredible diversity that was in King William. Um, you know, it talks about the, 
the graphic designer getting drunk with the postman and the local carpenter in his backyard, right? And it talked about, Corey, uh, this punk rock kid, right, that they saw skating down the street, that was me, and that's me in the center, with the love of my life on my arm. Next, Corey. So, um, King William um, uh, began to lose population in the, in the 1950s, late, late, early 1960s, late 1950s. Uh, when we first moved into the neighborhood, you know, most of the old houses were still chopped up into apartments. They were chopped up into apartments after World War II. Um, the, the Josky house that I just showed you, I think there were 15, 16 dwelling units in it. You know, they were little single room occupancy kind of things. Um, but the neighborhood was really dense. And the neighborhood at the time was against density, right? They were, and that was code word for like being against I think the, the poor folks who were who were you know living in really modest means in these kind of substandard structures, and you can see it in the data. So uh, last month I just kind of went through the old census records in 1960, and the census tract just for King William, and I'm talking about King William as an example of you know kind of broader neighborhoods. But um, the census data in 1960 for the tract that includes King William, there were 2,000 residents in 1970, which is after. Um, I would call it the first wave of gentrification, began in earnest. The population dropped to 1696. By 1990, it was down to 1572. The census tracts changed after that, um, but anecdotally, we know that the, 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 the population has now gone back to its 1960s levels, but only because of the big new apartment buildings that have been built around the perimeter of the neighborhood. So, um, and we've got some more data, and, and when I was working, doing the whole housing ecosystem analysis for the mayor, um, we were analyzing population shifts and trying to, trying to like nail down like what gentrification is, right? What does it mean? Are there stats that can, that can tell us? And, and what it showed, what we were able to determine was the, the census tracts where we saw a decline in low-income population and an, and an increase in, in high-income population. And so the trend continued in King William. While the population was going up, it was a population of largely higher income people. Next word. But it's not just King William. It's, it's all the, the, the inner city neighborhoods. Um, next. So it's, I mean, it's, and, and you, you guys, I mean, Rick, you know, it's, it's Tobin Hill, it's River Road, it's Alta Vista, Beacon Hill, Monta Vista, Government Hill, Mankey Park, Westward Alliance, it's, it's Roosevelt, it's, um, La Baca and it's and, and Denver Heights and Dignity Hill and the list goes on. You know, Dignity Hill, we've seen housing uh, valuations um, increase as much as a thousand percent over the last ten years, which is which is great in some cases, but it's also a challenge. Um, so, th so that change comes in two forms, right? The neighborhood change that we've been seeing in San Antonio over the last fifteen years or so. Um, we're seeing physical change, a lot of new construction that's perceived to be out of scale or inconsistent with the historic context, uh, and a strain on existing infrastructure in the form of traffic, parking, waste disposal, so on and so on and so forth. Uh, and socioeconomic, right? We just talked about increased property values, um, which which is a property tax cost burden for folks who who don't have you know senior exemptions or 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 veteran exemptions or what have you, and then higher rents. Um, which are leading to direct displacement, and you know the, the the big issue is that you have you have kids of kids who grew up in neighborhoods who can no longer kind of afford to move back into those neighborhoods, even if their parents are still there. So, um, just some I'll try to move through these pretty quickly. Some examples. So, I I first started working on affordable housing. I've been I've been working on affordable housing now almost my entire career. As a volunteer in the late 90s, when the San Antonio Housing Authority um, was preparing to tear down the Victoria Courts, right? And I was very familiar with it. I'd grown up in the neighborhood. These were my friends. I went to school with them. Um, and I participated as a neighborhood advocate. Court. Uh, here it is being demolished. Um, I was part of the team that developed the Hope 6 application, um, which was Henry Cisneros, then HUD Secretary's big idea at the time. They were going to we're going to redistribute um, poverty throughout San Antonio, and we're not going to concentrate public housing all in one place. Well, they tore down all the public housing units, and they've only built back in the place a few of them that were there, and not all of those have yet been 
replace the two public housing units, right, where you met. And so communities were displaced. I mean, these were communities that were entrenched, whether in the courts or living in the surrounding neighborhood and so forth, and these com communities persist today, still get together and have gatherings. Um, and here are some, some images. Next, please. Um, you know, the next thing we did was the, the decade of downtown, and I, I, I was on the team that put this, this plan together, the, the downtown strategic implementation plan, where we said, you know, none of the neighborhoods have had any investment since White Flight. Downtown basically hasn't, except for tourism and hotels. We need housing back downtown. So we developed a plan that was extraordinarily successful that lured 10,000 new housing units back downtown. However, we made a mistake. Um, although our reports have been narrowly focused on downtown, we layered those incentives over all the neighborhoods around downtown. And this was at a time when people were moving back downtown, getting interested in you know, walkable neighborhoods and high quality lifestyles. And, um, and you know, Ricky, you lived through it. I'm sure some of, the, some of the other folks in the room did too, right? Not only did your property values go up, there's like stuff getting knocked down all over the place, new, you know, new stuff coming in, which is great. There's new residents coming in, but, but there are challenges associated with it. Next, Corey. Uh, another example, San Antonio River Improvements Project, which my partner, Irby, uh, shepherded over its 13 years and co-chaired the oversight committee with former mayor, Lila Cockrell. Next, Corey. It's an amazing project, um, a benefit for all San Antonians, but it costs them some, some direct impacts, right? A big public infrastructure project. Uh, one example was the Mission Trails Trailer Park, um, which, which was cleared in favor of higher income apartments. Uh, Pearl, right? Didn't really displace anybody, uh, but it was such a cash infusion into such a small area that the ripple effects were just extraordinary. Next picture. Um, you yeah, know, this, this is an example in, um, um, uh, kind of southern Mankey Park. I'm not sure what you call that area, uh, but it's it's old Fort Sam housing, off base housing, a lot of modest fourplexes and duplexes, apartment units needed a lot, of, had a lot of deferred maintenance to be done, but were but were all torn down, like whole streets of them, in favor of of, of single family homes for for high income folks. So we're we're dropping density and we're move, removing the ability for um, folks of of lesser means to have an opportunity to live close to these great resources next. So, so what do we do, right? What do, there's there's got to be an answer. There's got to be a path forward. Um, first, I want to talk about two terms, right? Um, density, which is which is a firm, which is a term that I think everybody's probably pretty familiar with, right? That's the number of people in like a a measure of land, right? Living in a measure of land. Intensity is something we care a lot about in historic districts. Intensity is the, the amount of stuff, right? The, the volume of building that you're building per measure of land. These are two entirely different things, right? Next, next slide, please. So here's an example. This is, um, I'm not sure what it's called, uh, but it's there at the corner of Ceballos and um, I-35. And it's, it's approximately 30 dwelling units per acre. Right, because it's three story, it's walk up, there's big parking lots, there's they're giant units, they're, um, they're set back pretty far from the street. Next, please. This is at the corner of Beauregard and Madison in King William. And it's cute as a bug, it's pushed right up to the sidewalk, it doesn't have any parking behind it. It's 126 dwelling units per acre, right? So it's like almost four times as dense, or yeah, yeah, four times as dense as the other thing, but it's but it's sensitively scaled, right? It fits into the neighborhood. It's probably you know a little more urban than we're than we're used to seeing in our historic districts. But that's just to kind of show you you know kind of clearly what the difference is between intensity and density. So preservation principle number one, and these are mine. I just made them up for a talk to the conservation society about a month and a half ago. Um, so support, as, as, as we're thinking about, um, as community advocates, as there's zoning cases coming up, as there's historic cases coming up, as you're hearing about some new development that's happening down the road, um, I, I think we should support the, the redevelopment in, of industrial and commercial parcels at any density or intensity, so long as you develop a great public realm, a great streetscape that plugs into historic neighborhoods. A great example is Dean Steele. 
right? It was this property, and the old industrial property, and they wanted to come in and zone it for high rises. It's outside the historic district, surrounded by commercial stuff, and, and they were told no. And that's actually the perfect place to put, put density and intensity because it, it, it takes pressure off of the historic neighborhoods for infill development. Next. So here's an example. This is one of my projects. This is the old Savaya, well, I think it's, I forget what it's called now, but it was the Savaya's Lofts when it was built. And this is on Savaya Street. This is what I mean by a great streetscape. You look at the back side of this, it's just like a great big four-story building in a, in a parking lot. But as it pushes up to the street, it creates a public realm that can hook right into a historic district if it needed to. Uh, this is another one of my projects. This is uh, Big Tex. It's the, the old Big Tex grain site. Um, another, another great example of developing not in the historic district, but outside of it. And you know, the King William Association at the time was great. They were like, yeah, this, we need to support this because it takes pressure off of our neighborhood and it allows um, more affordable than the you know, big you know, multi-million dollar mansions, more affordable housing than that. Um, and it's got a great streetscape. In this case, it's a trail. I worked for probably 10 years between the, the railroads and the city and the river authority and the, the property owners to come up with a trail alignment that actually, actually worked. Here's another one of my projects. These are uh, some brownstones, townhouses, uh, outside, of, outside of Pearl. And so if we're gonna come back in and we're gonna build new stuff um, in the old industrial areas, Right? Let's 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 make it let's make it comfortable for people to to be in. Let's make it shaded. And let's create great outdoor spaces. Uh, another project of mine. Um, this is a you know, what what could have been typical garden apartments on the near west side. Um, it's a redevelopment of the old Arbolitos Nursery. This is a San Antonio housing now opportunity home uh, project, but it's pushed right up to the street. And again, a great streetscape created. So principle number two, and again, these are just my made up principles, right? Um, advocate for thoughtful projects that are higher density and intensity, but you gotta be really thoughtful to pull these off in, in, in historic neighborhoods. Next. So case study number one. Uh, this, is, this is a project in, in Tobin Hill that caused a lot of uproar back in the day. The existing conditions, this is on East Mistletoe. Uh, the developers came in, and this is a pretty standard pattern, they get a lot or two lots, and they subdivide it into six lots, put a driveway down the middle, and then you know, two, three, or four story, uh, three of each on, on either side of that driveway, right? Which, it looks kind of fine and planned, but if you live right next to it, it's, you're, you're, depending on which side of your are, your morning sun or your evening sun is totally blocked because it, you know, it, 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 it puts shade over the middle of the yard, over the rear of the yard, and over the front, and it's two or three or even four stories tall in some cases. Um, so the neighborhood approached me and said, hey, is there another way we could do this? Like, is there another way that we could approach the developer and, and say, you know, look, you can get the same square footage, the same sellable square footage, but do something that is in alignment with um, the the traditional neighborhood patterns in the neighborhood. And I said, well, yeah, sure there is, but you know, they wouldn't be standalone garden homes. In this case, uh, yeah, in this case, you might have two pair of duplexes up front, the sort of one story uh, in the first, you know, 30, 30 foot lot layer or so that's in alignment with the other one story houses on the street, pop up to two stories in the middle, and then do some one story kind of carriage house units in the back. So you get a variety of unit sizes, but the same sellable square footage. And most importantly, the center of that lot is kept open for solar access uh, for the neighbors on both sides. Next. So they ultimately built this, and if you drive by it, it's cute, um, it, but, it, but it's not as, as good as it could be. The, and the developer was, was on board, but ultimately they said, look, we've already paid for these plans, we're already in permitting, we really just need to do this, which is understandable. So it goes to show that when we get in conversations with developers who are in our neighborhood, like, let's, let's get to them early, right? And they may not have a set of plans they're already working on and, and have a conversation with them about, you know, about different alternatives. So case study number two. Um, this is another one of my projects, uh, Cedar at Parita. This one was really interesting. It's the old children's shelter which was a mission that, that we all supported and should support, but it was really disruptive for the neighborhood because you know, you'd, have, you'd have 
kids incoming in the middle of the night and you know, uh, maybe a drunken dad coming down you know, with a gun at three in the morning and just all sorts of, of disruption that, that was happening. And so they moved and we had the opportunity to do an infill project. Next, please. So, um, you know, we, the developers had to get a certain amount of square footage on the project for it to work. And that's significantly more square footage, I think, than the neighborhood was comfortable at the time. So we engaged in a year-long community engagement process. There was over 50 meetings, um, most of them public meetings, but sometimes just on people's front porches or, you know, uh, having tacos at Tito's and coffee in the morning or what have you, to try to figure out a solution. And uh, let's go to the next. Uh, slide. So, you know, here's the site. Here's the site right here. Here's Bonham Elementary School, back to Bonham, my old neighborhood. There's a house right behind Bonham, the old Solon Stewart house, that a lady named Mary Nethery and others had tried for years to preserve. And um, the, ha the, the school district wanted it gone because Bonham's a landlocked campus and they needed more room for administrative building or for uh, academic buildings and, and so forth. And, and I said, because we've got this, this, this little piece right here facing Farina Street. I said, well, why don't we ask the school district if we can have the house? And then we'll just we'll move it over there. We'll stick it on Farina Street. And everybody got behind it. The school district got behind it, paid the $250,000 to move the thing, and everyone was happy. You know, when it came time to go through HDRC, the neighborhood came out, and all the immediate neighbors, except one, um, came out to speak in support of the project. And there's the Solon Stewart House before and after in its new place on Parita Street. And you know, this, this, this was us really looking at the context and beginning to think about the scale of these big Victorian structures and how we can modulate that scale. Um, and, and we did, and this was the ultimate result. This is the corner of Cedar and Parita. And um, we, we were able to reduce the apparent mass, the, the apparent intensity of this structure such that it became, um, um, a, a, such that it was included in the, the recent revision of the guidelines for new construction in the historic district as, as a way to tackle this problem. Next. And there's some more images. More images. More happy images. Okay, preservation principle number three. S support density over intensity with sensitive multi-unit structures and accessory dwelling units. Um, and, and I talked a little bit about sensitive multi-unit structures in those case studies, but I'm gonna talk mostly about accessory dwelling units here. Um, so first off, what is an accessory dwelling unit? ADU, and Jordan's here. Jordan, you should come up and talk about accessory <laughs> dwelling units. Um, so they're, they're little structures, or usually in people's backyards, right? Uh, they're permanent buildings, they're not trailers. Um, they're, they're connected to utilities. Um, they can be attached, right? They could be a garage conversion. They could be a back apartment that's attached. They could be a, a wing of the house that's carved out as an apartment unit. And there's all sorts of names for these that you've probably heard before, like casita and carriage house and alley flat and back house and granny flat and in-law suite and so on and so forth, right? They take many forms. They're all over San Antonio. So, this is where I live right now on, on King William Street. This is the carriage house uh, behind 241 King William Street. I helped my mother put two apartments into it back in the 90s as I was kind of working my way through school. And um, I officed there during the pandemic and when my wife and I separated, I moved in and my mother got cancer at the time and I was looking for a place to kind of move on and I had the opportunity to be there with her for the last two years of her life. She passed away earlier this year. Um, but prior to that, it was the first home for my brother and his and his wife and my niece and nephew. They, you know, as they were getting on their feet, he was a long, young lawyer. Um, they lived there for probably six or seven years, and then it became rental income, right? The upstairs and the downstairs apartment. And then um, my mom was running, doing her main house as an Airbnb, and it became a short-term rental for a period. And then it became a long-term rental for a while, and then, uh, or, or family would stay there. And then I moved in, and I'm living there now, right? So it, it just goes to show that these structures have like all kinds of uses over time, depending on the needs of the family at the time. So 
What's great about ADUs, right? We get diverse, sustainable neighborhoods, um, new housing units in existing neighborhoods um, that contribute to income diversity, don't largely impact the character of streets. These are all over the place, but you wouldn't know it driving down the streets of, it, of any historic district. Uh, and, and minimal or no uh, new utility or infrastructure requirements. Um, they provide smaller housing options, you know, for, for starter families or, or um, you know, singles or aging adults or what have you. They don't need a 2,500 or a 4,000 square foot house, right? They just need a little place to hang their hat. Um, and they're environmentally sustainable because they use fewer materials and less energy. Um, importantly, um, they can be designed to be ADA accessible, you know, as, 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 as my parents um, all around have, have aged, I've begun to understand what that really means. You know, when you've got somebody who has mobility issues, um, an age, aging loved one or, or someone who gets sick, like what it means, it's not just wheelchair accessible, it's like, how do you how do you get somebody into the tub? It doesn't mean you need a shower and like like the clearance to not just have that person wheel around in a wheelchair, but have somebody assist them to do all the things that they need. And you have the ability, if you're building a new structure, to solve all these problems up front when all the older houses clearly had not been designed to solve for this. And many of them are in fact up off the ground on piers. Um, you know, you can put them into your, exist, in, into your existing backyard and you can develop multi-generational households. You know, mom or dad can live in the back and help take care of the kids and, you know, maybe get inside and cook and spend time with you and the grandkids and provide a, a benefit to you, like, you know, as a, as a, as a working person. All right, um, they're cost effective, right? Generally, you've already bought the land, you already have the utilities stubbed out, all you gotta do is build this thing in the back. Um, they're fairly easy to construct. Um, generally speaking, they're one story and fairly small. And you can, if you have a design, you can repeat it across multiple sites. And then, as I just as I just described, you can use it. There are all sorts of uses, right? It increases your home value for starters, not by as much as the main house, because Bay Appraisal District only appraises it at fifty percent of the value of the main house. But it's but it's value nonetheless. It's potential income stream long-term rental, short-term rental, flex flexibility, and you're leveraging your most valuable asset, um, you know, most Americans' most valuable asset, which is their home. Um, so, accessory dwelling units in King William, in preparation for this, I actually got out and just, just walked a couple of blocks around to see if I could, you know, grab some images, and immediately, like within two blocks, I discovered 25 or so. Look, the, the image on the right, that's two separate accessory dwelling units in one picture. I was like, wow, they're, ev they're literally everywhere. But you see they take all sorts of forms, converted garages, you know, the bottom left, just like a, a, a little accessory dwelling unit above a one car garage, same for the one on the right, or a separate little house, the one on the upper uh, right. Corey? Here's some more examples in King William. Just all sorts of different scales. Next, and even more. Um, those were all within um, probably 50 feet of each other. And they're, they're everywhere around San Antonio. Um, I think Corey went out and took a couple of photos uh, the other day, and this was, I don't know, 20 minutes, Corey, driving around, just bang, bang, bang. These are the ones we just had. Oh, yeah, those are the ones you just had laying around, right? But they're very non-assuming. Like, you, you, you drive around and you peek behind people's houses and you say, oh, that's just a garage or that's just a carport. But a lot of these are or could be used for accessory dwelling units. They're all over the town, all over the south side. You know, I posit that there are tens of thousands of these, and most of them are banded ADUs. Like, folks just went out and built a place because they needed a place for their brother or, or for their mom or whatever. Um, there are, uh, at last, last count, approximately 315,000 single-family zone lots in San Antonio, um, and it's something like 90% of the, the land area in San Antonio. Uh, is res residentially zoned in some form. But 315,000 lots, they keep saying, they've been saying for five or six years, we've got a million new people coming to San Antonio in the next decade. Well, they're, they're coming, and it's, I mean, the population is growing fast. But if, if half of the residential lots in San Antonio had an, a modest accessory dwelling unit in the back, right, that's 155,000 new housing units that are gonna house an average of 1.5 people because their size, or, or two, like, we're a third of the way there. 
to solving our housing problem, and homeowners are reaping the benefits of this rather than individual developers, or rather than right, the big developers that are building big apartment complexes. And we're creating diverse neighborhoods. Next. Mm -hmm. So back to King William Street. Um, this is the Joski House today um, that my mother spent her life restoring. Next one, Corey. She was an author. She um, did an exhaustive history of all of the properties in King William, um, both north and south of, of Alamo, in two volumes. She went back and did the deep research back to the people who originally built every single structure and who owned them throughout the years. And, and it's amazing. What, what this revealed to me is that these historic districts are not museums to be frozen in time, in some, you know, um, some point in time for us to go and gawk at, right? These are living, breathing organisms, all of, all of our historic neighborhoods and older neighborhoods that have seen uh, generations of communities, you know, living there together, working together, and, and ultimately dying, and the character of them changes over time, right? These are places where we live, and we, we've got to think about strategies like some of the ones that I, I presented to you today to allow those to continue to serve future generations of San Antonians. Thank you. Questions? Questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, yeah, there are. So, yeah. Um, so we just went through a huge public uh, process, uh, and Jordan was my partner in crime back there a couple of years ago to amend the Unified Development Code to make it easier to build accessory dwelling units throughout San Antonio. Now, if, if you're deed restricted through a homeowner association or whatever, you can't do it. Um, but through most of San Antonio. We can now build them easier, we can build them bigger, we can build them closer to the property line, there's fewer restrictions overall. Uh, it used to be uh, dependent on your, your lot size, um, and so you know, we'd, end up, or we'd end up with some pretty small ones or unable to build them at all. Um, however, uh, historic districts have another layer of review that we have to go through at the moment, um, which, which, is, which, is, which is fitting and proper. Right, they can't say, no, you can't build one that big, but it's in the rear yard, and what the historic review does is helps you to develop a, a set of plans and elevations that are somewhat compatible with your neighbors, right? Um, and there was another point I was gonna, oh, yeah, and so the, the City of San Antonio Neighborhood and Housing Services right now is engaged in a, in a massive effort to make it easier to uh, design, uh, finance, and build accessory dwelling units around San Antonio, and they're developing some standard plans, right, that will, that will be approved. We'll have some sort of review process that's already happened, um, and um, they'll be pre-approved by development services, so getting them uh, permitted will be easier, and hopefully we'll have financing resources in place, new, new financial products, uh, working with local lenders, and um, local contractors that are, that are trained to do this. This is an initiative we started three or four years ago that's really gaining steam. Um, but we will always have some form of review in our historic districts. It may not be as intense as if you're just building a new house from scratch, but some form of review. Example of? Yeah, so my question was, are there any specific restrictions of ADU that are historic? Well, um, no more, Corey, I don't think any more specific than what's in the. Right, I feel like I was I mean, that's what I was going to say. So Jim alluded to the development code does have parameters on like, how big can you be compared to the, the primary and all of that lot coverage. And so for the most part, the historic design guidelines are going to mirror a lot of that, but they're also going to add the added layer of kind of what it looks like. And so in terms of materiality, like what materials are used, um, sometimes architectural style, like typically, um, these would look a little bit like the primary structure. Um, but to Jim's point earlier, these are for the most part existing. Like this is part of the historic development pattern. A lot of historic properties already have these. Um, and so, you know, from the mindset of historic and design review, it's already in keeping with that. Sorry, just right. okay. yeah. I guess yeah. that means that so one of my properties is a multi-family duplex. So if I wanted to add a unit to that. Yeah. yeah, you can do it if you're zoned for it. Yeah, zoned for it. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, you can do it. How would I get this measured? It's fifty percent of the of the footprint of the primary structure or of the of the floor area of the primary structure. Can you talk to zoning staff? Talk, yeah, zoning staff can walk you through it. So um, the, the UDC was specifically amended, and I have yet to see this play out in, in reality because it's, it's still new and we have not a lot of new ones built. But it was, it was amended to allow you a minimum of 800 square feet, no matter how big your house is, right? So if your house is 1,000 square feet, you used to only be able to do a 500 square foot accessory dwelling unit. Now the floor is, eight, you can always do up to 800 square feet. Even if you've got a tiny little house on a tiny little lot on the west side, right? And this was an equity issue because a lot of the houses, especially on the near west side, or the lots, especially on the near west side, but in other parts of, of San Antonio, the lots are, are too small to accommodate an accessory dwelling unit legally and maintain the 50% open area, right? So, and this is gonna, I, I, do we have a DSD person here? I believe that this supersedes the, the intent of it was to supersede the 50% open area requirement. Yeah, and um, so in historic districts, there's the added layer. Um, generally, the rule is that you don't build footprints that exceed 50% of the, the property area. But once you add the traditional front yard space and your normal setbacks, you're pretty much there. So it does allow for quite a bit of density in terms of building footprint. And then the lawn rule is a little bit separate. So that's saying, you know, your remaining open green space needs to remain 50% unpaved, essentially. Or it could be, or it could be permeable paving yeah. in a driveway or whatever. Yes, sir. Yeah, just uh, naive question, but I'm Absolutely. Um, well, in, in, in Monticello in particular, the alleys weren't really designed to be parked off of, but your trash trucks go up and down those alleys, right? And I just went through this on a project that I was working on in Jefferson, just south of there. And, um, you know, most of the back buildings are, are front loaded from, from driveways off of the main streets on the front rather than the alley. But the alley's there, right? So there's no reason why you shouldn't use it. Uh, and, I, and I will tell you that um, e accessory dwelling units under 800 square feet don't require an additional parking space by code. How, however, you know, if you want to provide it, you know, I, I think you've got a great case for it. But you're in a historic district, so you would go talk to HDR, talk to historic preservation staff about that, but ultimately it would probably have to go to the Historic and Design Review Commission. Yes, ma'am. I don't know if this is a question so much as a comment. In my neighborhood, we have an awful lot of uh, accessory dwellings. Uh, and we also have narrow streets. And it has gotten to the point where I really doubt that in many of the streets, an emergency vehicle can get down the street because of all the on-street parking from the accessory dwellings and the short-term rentals. So my problem is that it seems to me that before any of this development is allowed, there needs to be traffic studies, and I don't think there are. I'm pretty sure there aren't. I think that the, uh, the code 
the city code don't require it uh, up until certain, you know, certain things happen. And it doesn't have to do with, with uh, has very little to do with established neighborhoods. Ricky, what's the narrowest street in your neighborhood in feet? The narrowest? The narrowest in width in feet. I don't know what the feet, the, the footage is. Uh, I know that the one I live on, East Myrtle Street, is a lot narrower than either Dewey or Locust, which are adjacent streets. Um, I think maybe parts of Clark's Avenue are also narrow. Um, so. Well, you, you, you know, you, you have a good point. Um, Cities all over the country, and in fact, the world, um, experience the traffic congestion on residential streets. That's, and, and that's, that's part of what, what we have to deal with. You know, the, the short-term rentals is an entirely diff different issue, and, and I agree with you on all of that. Um, accessory dwelling units, generally speaking, um, add about 50% as many cars as a single-family house because they're smaller. They tend to be occupied by individuals and if they're living in the inner city they may be young professionals that are just getting started or college students they're much less likely to have a car they're more likely to ride a bike there will be more cars but you know we've we've studied a number of streets over the years you know Lavaca went through a whole traffic control plan king william went through a whole traffic control plan we measured every single street and we determined that there wasn't a single street in any of the south of downtown historic districts that could not accommodate an emergency vehicle. Uh, they might have slowed down a little bit, uh, which we want everybody to slow down on our streets, right? That's one of the things that having cars parked on both sides of the street does, is it slows people down. It makes it safer to be on those streets. But every single one of those streets was wide enough to have a car parked on either side and a generous space for an emergency vehicle to make it down. Emergency vehicles travel on our traffic lanes today, which are 10 to 11 feet wide. Uh, the fire department will approve fire lanes as narrow as from the fire department. Jordan, 15 feet? Yeah, and, and so you know, the, the average fire truck's about 96 inches wide, and the fire trucks here in San Antonio are the same ones that they use in New York and Boston, so, I mean, they get the type of places that are already in very dense environments, so I, I'll tell you from a public safety concern, we can get fire trucks and ambulances into any San Antonio street, assuming somebody's not parked in the, the middle. Right. That said, is it a nuisance? <laughs> it's a real problem sometimes trying to get out of your driveway. I agree. I have the, I have the same issue in King Lee. And in, in my experience, very frankly, in the older neighborhoods, uh, the access to the ADU is often the driveway that was originally built for the house. Right. So you have the person who is renting or whatever, living in the ADU, parking in the driveway, and the people who live in the house parking on the street, or vice versa. Sure. So. Come. All right, Jim, I love, the, I love the perspective that you offer, you know, or your resident perspective, and I think that's Yeah, you're looking at it, right? This, this, this is what we do. It's what the Office of Historic Preservation does every day. Um, it's what Neighborhood and Housing Services is, is trying to do every day. It's what Development Services is gonna be doing over the course of this next year as we begin to talk about the advanced rapid transit policy changes that are accompanying that on the silver line and the green line, right? It's, but it's, it's tough, right? There are a lot of people in San Antonio and there's a lot of complicated policy and there's a lot of big, like, complicated ideas. But, you know, folks who show up at these meetings, like, like, like Ricky, shows up all the time. Like, we've got some great neighbor. We don't always agree on, on everything that we're, we're, you know, we're talking about. But, you know, reaching out to the neighborhoods, getting involved in your neighborhood associations is the easiest way for the city or anybody else, people like me, to have a, a point of contact, right? Because there's generally a mailing list and there's newsletters and so forth. Um, but I think part of it is that, you know, San Antonians in general um, 
to get to get excited about getting more engaged, um, and then we can we can reach um, more people. One more. Omar. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the mission reach. Well, the 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 river improvements project is done now um, completely, and you know we've seen some limited change. We're in a we're in an economic downturn right now, so there's not a lot of new construction that's happening uh, this year and last year. I mean, most of our projects dried up, um, but it, but it'll start again. You know, I I think what's really going to happen is there were there were some early adopters who said, hey, there's this great national park. You know, World Heritage deal that's coming in, and we got to we got to invest in all this land because it's going to take off, and development's just going to you know shoot south down the river like wildfire. Well, that didn't really happen. There was there was some there was some intense development kind of in the you know and, and, and property value increases sort of in, in Roosevelt. There was the St. John's project. There was the you know Mission Trails project. I forget what it's called. But there ha you know until you get down to military in Brooks. There really still hasn't been any new development to speak of, and so now all the neighbors are going, "Hey, what about all this development you promised us? And like, where's our new retail? And where's our services? And so forth? And and where's the where's the market rate housing? And so I think it's going to, you know, it, things will change. You know, it, that's that's the nature of cities. They're in constant flux. They constantly change. But but our goal as policymakers and, and advocates is to make that change manageable, right? So that everybody gets to benefit from that change. Um, rather than find it to their detriment. And so I think it's gonna happen at a slower pace, um, like we've all envisioned, where people can adjust to it over time and, and reap the benefits of it. One, one, one more. <laughs> So those conversations have been happening in the background, recognizing that there is a problem and that a conversation needs to happen. There is a community, a massive community engagement process that's in the works that starts at zero, that starts with no solutions. Um, in fact, I'm in talks with VIA and, and Development Services and Neighborhood and Housing Services right now about the character of that. And uh, I expect the, uh, you know, that contract will get approved shortly, and within the next month or so, you're gonna start seeing some, there's gonna be a website set up, and they're, they're gonna have outreach directly to you. Well, I mean, why did that start I mean, you know, because, you know, they, you know, Via is just, has tunnel vision, and you know, all they think about is buses and their passengers, but it's gonna have a huge impact on neighborhoods, and there's been no discussion. I, I agree completely. I will say, and we've gotta wrap up, like, right now, um, they, they started before the pandemic with the, um, the community engagement process. That and every other process got shut down during the pandemic. They just got funding last year, and now they're ready to start. All right, round of applause for Jen. Thank you again. Thank you.